Hi everyone, in this video we are going to investigate double slit interference and we're going to do it using the method of phases. I will say that you can solve this problem purely algebraically without ever thinking about phases, but personally I find that the phaser approach offers a lot more intuition um, and understanding of what the maths behind interference really means. So the setup that we're dealing with is that we have some kind of wave coming in from left to right on my diagram. You might want to imagine it as a light wave, but it could equally well be sound or a water wave, any type of wave. So our incoming wave is then going to encounter an obstacle, which is this bit of the diagram. As you can see, the obstacle is basically just a barrier with two very thin slits cut into it. We're going to pretend, in fact, that the two slits are infinitesimally thin, and we are specifying that they're a distance d apart from each other. So the wave will then diffract through each of the two slits, and because we're pretending that they're infinitesimally thin, each slit acts as if it were just a point source of that wave, and so you've got two point sources sending a signal out to the right, and those two signals are of course going to interfere with each other because at some places they'll be in phase, some places they'll be in antiphase, and in general they'll be somewhere in between those two conditions. So if our wave is a light wave, imagine what would happen if you put a screen down somewhere on the right hand side of the double slit, you would see an interference pattern appearing with some bright bits and some dark bits. If it was a sound wave, the equivalent would be that there would be some places where the sound was loud and other places where it was quiet. Now in general terms, what that's saying is that the intensity of the resultant wave is varying as you move along the screen, and that's exactly what we want to find. I've said here, using phases, find the intensity on the screen, which is i as a function of theta. What's theta? Well, it's just a way to parameterize your position on the screen. For example, if you want the intensity at this point on the screen, um, you draw the line from that point to the midpoint of the slits, draw the horizontal, the dashed line in my diagram, and that is the definition of your angle theta. So next, I just want to add a couple of things to my diagram, which are basically the light rays, or I guess sound rays, or whatever types of wave you're dealing with, um, coming from each of the slits to the point of interest uh, on the screen. Now, in general terms, each of those rays will have its own displacement that it's producing at the point of interest on the screen, and those displacements are going to add together according to the principle of superposition to make an overall displacement, and you could write that um, by calling your displacement psi, for example, you say psi is psi1 plus psi2, where psi1 and psi2 are the displacements due to the individual rays. And by the way, the meaning of that word displacement will depend on what type of wave we're dealing with. If it's a light wave or some other electromagnetic wave, then it's going to mean uh, the size of the electric or magnetic field produced at that point. If it's a sound wave, it's going to be um, the displacement, the actual physical displacement of each little air molecule um, from its equilibrium position. Now it's important to point out that I'm going to use a convention where psi and psi1 and psi2 are all complex numbers. Now you can do all this using just real numbers because after all, displacements are physical quantities, they're measurable and therefore they are real quantities. Um, but mathematically it turns out that complex numbers um, are just more convenient to deal with. So the way it works is that each of those terms represents a wave, the modulus of each complex number is the amplitude of the corresponding wave, and the argument um, of each complex number is the phase of that particular wave. So you add your complex numbers together, you get some overall um, complex number psi, which tells you about the amplitude of the resultant wave and the phase of the resultant wave, and it's a general property of waves that the intensity of a wave is proportional to the square of its amplitude, but we've just said that the amplitude is the modulus of the complex number, so we can say i is proportional to mod of psi squared. If you wanted to more explicitly show that these were complex numbers, you could write psi1 as some complex amplitude a uh, multiplied by a time varying term e to the i omega t, just varying sinusoidally with time. What about psi2? Well, psi2 is very similar to psi1 because they both came from the same incoming wave, so they've got the same angular frequency omega, and they've also got the same amplitude, assuming that the wave fronts, um, the incoming wave fronts were of uniform amplitude. So we've still got this a, and we've still got um, our e to the i omega T. The only difference between the two waves coming from each of the slits is that they're out of phase, because if you look at the diagram you can see that the red line at the bottom is longer than the red line at the top, so there's a path difference between them, therefore there's a phase difference between them. I'm just going to introduce that phase difference by representing it as e to the i phi, so phi is the phase difference between the two beams. This is the point where you have two choices as to how to proceed, either you just do the algebra, add the complex numbers together, and find the squared modulus and you'll get an expression for your intensity. But 
we're going to use phases and phases are basically um, arrows drawn on an argand diagram showing the real and imaginary parts of each complex number. So let's start by drawing an arrow on our diagram to represent that first complex number a e to the i omega t. We're going to start it from the origin and I'll just draw it with some uh, arbitrary argument uh, represented by this angle here. What is that argument? Well it's omega t from this e to the i omega t but also bear in mind that a itself is a complex amplitude and so we're going to have to add on whatever the argument of a uh, is. What about the length of that arrow? Well the length of the arrow is just the modulus of the complex number and the modulus of e to the i omega t is 1 and so you only get uh, contribution from the a. So the, the length of that arrow is just the modulus of a. Now adding complex numbers graphically is the same as adding vectors graphically. In other words, if you want to do it, you have to put them head to tail. So I'm going to now draw on my second complex number, the one that was the same but that differs by a phase of phi. How's it going to look? Well, it's still going to have um, a modulus of mod a, but it's just going to be rotated by a little bit more than the first arrow. So if I try to draw that on uh, it doesn't have to be perfectly to scale, but it's going to be something like this. And uh, the length of that arrow is still modulus of A. And this angle here between the first um, complex number and the second one is just the phase difference, phi. Now the resultant of adding those two things together, in other words, the psi in our original equation up at the top there, um, is just the complex number that takes us from the tail of the first vector uh, or first complex number, sorry, to the head of the second one. And we know that the length of that arrow is mod psi, which is ultimately what we're looking for. Remember that this diagram applies at one particular instant in time, because this angle here, that argument of the very first complex number is omega t plus the argument of a, and omega t is just linearly increasing in time. So you've got to picture this entire diagram, or those three arrows, just rotating around at some constant uniform rate. That doesn't affect any of our working though, because all we care about for the purposes of finding the intensity um, is the length of that overall arrow psi. So we've made a triangle, two of the sides are known, they're mod a, um, we want the third side. We also know one of the angles in the triangle, this one here is going to be pi minus phi because you've got this straight line on which the total angle is pi. Now if you've got a triangle and you know two sides and one angle and you want the third side, you can use the cosine rule to do that. So if you apply the cosine rule, you get modulus of psi squared is equal to, well, mod a squared plus mod a squared, so two mod a squared minus and then two Again, mod a squared times the cosine of the angle between them, um, which is pi minus phi. Now we can use our double angle identities um, to note that cos of pi minus phi is the same as minus cos phi. And so you can then factor out two mod a squared and write this as one plus cos of phi. So this is already a perfectly good expression, um, however it's conventional uh, to use trig identities to write this in a slightly neater looking form. So the trig identity that's going to be useful here um, is actually cosine of 2x. That's the standard result, the cos of 2x is 2 cos squared of x minus 1. Why is that relevant here? Well you add 1 to both sides, so 1 plus cos of 2x is 2 cos squared of x. and this is relevant because in the brackets in our psi squared expression, you've got 1 plus cos phi. Um, in this identity, we've got 1 plus cos of 2x. And so you could think, well, 2x is like phi. If 2x is phi, then x would be phi over 2. And therefore, this whole bracketed term, 1 plus cos phi, is the same as 2 cos squared of phi over 2. So the 2 in the 2 cos squared phi over 2 combines with this 2 here and makes a 4, and you get 4 mod a squared times cos squared of phi over 2. Now how does this relate to intensities? Well the intensity is proportional to mod of psi squared. So what I'm going to do is just write the left hand side as i. The right hand side I'm going to write as 4 i naught coming from the mod a squared. I'll explain what that is in a second. We've still got our cos squared of phi over 2. Now i naught is proportional to mod a squared. A was the complex amplitude um, of the wave coming out of each of the slits. Therefore mod A is the actual amplitude of each of those two waves and mod A squared is proportional to the intensity of the wave that would be produced by each individual slit. So to summarize that, the parameter I naught is the intensity 
that you would get on the screen um, due to one slit only. So the final step is going to be to figure out what phi actually is, because phi, remember, is just the phase difference between those two um, waves coming from each of the slits, but that wasn't specified in the original problem. So what actually is phi? So to figure that out, I've just added a couple of lines um, onto my original diagram here and made a little blue triangle. And the reason that's useful is that you can see that the bottom length of that triangle is the extra distance that the ray at the bottom travels compared with the ray at the top. So I'm going to label that P D for path difference. At this point, we're going to make an approximation and we're going to say that the screen is very far away from the double slit. Now try to visualize how the diagram would change as you move the screen very, very far to the right. You can see that the red lines and indeed the black line in the middle of the two red lines are going to become more and more close to being parallel. If the screen is very far away, we can say that the lines are all essentially parallel to each other. So under the assumption that those three lines there are all parallel, it follows that this little angle here, the one at the top of the blue triangle, is also theta. That follows um, from the fact that we've got a 90 degree angle there, and also from the fact that angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. I'll leave the details of that proof to the enthusiastic viewer to work through. It then follows from trigonometry that the path difference, the one that I marked on to my diagram, is approximately d sine theta because the hypotenuse of that blue triangle is just d. Now we've got the path difference. How do we convert a path difference into a phase difference? Because what we want is the phase difference um, phi. Well, uh, to do that, note that there are two pi radians in one full cycle of a wave. So if we take two pi, we can then multiply that by the fraction of a wavelength um, that the path difference is equal to. So we take our two pi and scale it by d sine theta divided by the wavelength of the wave, um, which is going to be called lambda. Um, and this is equal to, um, in more conventional parameters, kd sine theta. We usually introduce k, the wave number, um, which is just defined to be 2 pi over lambda. Finally, we can put all of this together to come up with our expression for the intensity as a function of theta. So again, approximately, because we assumed the screen was a large distance away, but i is going to be roughly 4 i naught, and then cos squared of kd sine theta um, divided by 2. So cos squared is just an oscillating function that goes between 0 and 1, um, which is consistent with what we said at the very beginning, where we said if it's light, for example, there would be dark patches and light patches um, just alternating with each other because of the constructive and um, destructive interference. Another thing I'll point out is watch the average intensity, the average intensity on the screen. Well, um, it's approximately equal to 4i0 times the average value of the cos squared function, but we just said cos squared oscillates between 0 and 1. The average value is going to be a half, and so the average intensity is 2i0. That makes a lot of physical sense because we said earlier that i0 was the intensity that you would get from one slit. So if you were to just you know, pretend that you didn't know the interference um, was something that happened, you might just guess that the overall intensity on the screen was two times i0 because you've got two slits, and that's consistent um, with the average intensity that we actually do get. So thank you for watching this, and I'll be back soon to talk about how to use phases to find the diffraction pattern that you get from a slit of finite width.